Frankfurt. Who are you? Welcome to Cross Platform Podcast, where we discuss how to solve productivity problems across platforms. I'm Augusto Pinot. And I'm Mark Gelwix. And today, we don't know what we're talking about, but we know <laughs> it's around a phone. So the yeah. discussion the discussion starts on the following. Okay? I have seen more people now moving away from their PCs to their phones and using the tablets as a companion to the phone, not to the PC. And I have seen a lot of or often questions, what is the tablet? And so I tell people or answer people, what is your phone? What is the OS of your phone? And get exactly the same thing. And the, what got this discussion interesting on the pre-show was why? Why is people going away in a parent from that PC to that phone? Why is not the PC getting more value or more use when it's the phone that it seems to be getting more? Even I was sharing that I have recommend um, now more than one um, mid to high level executive to get a keyboard, okay? An actual full size keyboard, okay? For the iPad and connect it to their iPhone. And I have two clients who now carry two phones, not a tablet, not a PC. What they carry are two phones. One phone that is glued to that keyboard and one phone that they are interacting with because that allows them to have the two screens that they want, the two things and the phones, their iPhones, they synchronize to each other. So they can have two things moving in a very, very, very ridiculously portable thing that they can grab, that they can put in their pocket, that they can go and run. Is this a case that is the exception to the rule or is a tendency that we are seeing more and more where people, because they use their phone so much, because they are so familiar with what that phone can or cannot do to a certain extent, they are getting more comfortable to use that technology in that format. Even I can tell you my wife, who is not a techie person by any means, Okay, my wife, even for work, spend more time on her phone than any other device. And unless it's a PowerPoint presentation, that phone, that that sorry, that laptop may not go out. It's going to be the phone where she goes back and forward. So there's there's a couple of things that jump out at me with this. And, and we were talking about it in the pre-show and I've been thinking about it more as you've been talking here. One of the things is the difference between what is the right device to use all the time versus what is the right device to use for the task that is at hand. So mm -hmm. we were talking a little bit about, say, processing your email. I am very much a, if I am going through and purging my inbox, which I have to do regularly, I will do it on my phone because it's very much like a dating app where you can left swipe your email into the trash can, right, right swipe it to get a, a flag on it, whatever you want to do. It's very fast and efficient because it's a rapid type of thing. And the phone fits that kind of mindset. And I was trying to figure out why it fit that mindset so well. And I realized because it has no buttons. There's no extra extraneous functions in the way that I have to think about all the time. There's no keyboard shortcut to do a specific feature. There's no ribbon bar running across the top of all the different options I could possibly do with an email at any given time. So for that task at hand, that processing of the inbox, that device is perfect for it. For writing long emails, it's horrible for it. Why? Because I need those extra functions. To write a longer email, it makes perfect sense to write it with a keyboard and with a mouse and with the full ribbon bar functionality on a laptop or a Chromebook. Can I do it on a tablet? Sure. But when is that tablet going to be effective? When it has a keyboard attached to it so I can type. So it really comes back to that finding the device that matches the task that is at hand. And we get into this mindset, can I make this device do everything? 
and it's unrealistic. There's no way you can get a singular device to handle all the things that you need to do at any given time. So what you really have to look at is with the tasks that I have to do, can all my devices, one, do the tasks that they are best at, and two, and this is probably the more important piece, is that information available on all of those devices? I think that's where so many people get hung up because they get used to using a particular application and then they can't transition to another application that works with the same set of data in the background. So if we talk about like emails, for example, Outlook on my phone looks radically different than Outlook on my desktop. Mm -hmm. They they know where, matter of fact, the two different versions of Outlook on my desktop look totally different. They're still using the same set of information in the background. Right. But I have to make sure that I'm not trying to do things on one device that are really better done on the other one. And I can understand where people get challenged with this. And I can also understand where people will say, hey, I just want to do it from my phone. I just want to do everything from my phone because it's the device they have the most intimate relationship with of all their technology. A laptop, you use it, you type on it, you close it, you put it away. You don't freak out when you leave your laptop behind at home when you're going to the store. You don't, you don't lose your sense of calm when you can't find your laptop because you're going to the bathroom. I mean, it's that kind of thing. But phones do that. That little supercomputer in your pocket has become that true... And we've used the term many a time, and I, I still think it needs to come back. This is your personal digital assistant. Yep. It is your assistant in your pocket. And if we're able to help people identify what are the right tasks to be doing with that assistant versus the tasks that are best done with something else, that's that's where productivity really starts to show up. And I, I know as you were talking, I was thinking and laughing at myself, are we back to the BlackBerry days just with a more powerful device? You know, when I remember when the BlackBerry came, I don't know, I got my BlackBerry in, in the 90s. And when the BlackBerry came, that was the dream for the BlackBerry to replace. And even I remember... I, I was never a big BlackBerry guy, but I remember people in the airport, you know, never thinking about pulling their laptop and all their world, you know, typing on that little keyboard. Mm -hmm. uh, I was faster in graffiti uh, in the Palm Pilot than that. But but it's still, the computer, my computer was that. And that's where I am very careful because I have been an outlier of this forever. My first computer that I could afford was a Pan Pilot. So I didn't have at that time the luxury to say, okay, it's a laptop or a Palm. The option was mm -hmm. a Palm or nothing. So I got that Pan Pilot and I learned how to get the most out of that thing. Okay. And, and I use it as a laptop replacement. I had a keyboard. I have everything. And because of that, it was very natural for me to migrate to the, the iPad as my main device. I just have now a big pump pilot with almost mm -hmm. unlimited power. Okay, My power is limited to what Apple limits sometimes on the things that I can do. It's not a processor anymore. Okay, I even there is now, thanks to the EU, you can run in in the beefiest iPads, a full version of Windows, if you choose to. Why? I don't know. But that's a different story. Okay, The geek in me can start a Windows machine yes. in there. You can do it if you need to. Okay. And, but it comes then to not the outliers like me, but where is that more average user? And one of the things that for me is very interesting is in general, 
I have found that people is afraid of technology and you have done support a lot more than me. And I'm sure you can testify to, to this. The, the problem many times is not that the user knows or don't know how to or scan or cannot solve the issue is that the user is terrified of click there because he's afraid that he will lose information or the computer will shut down or whatever. So you know, that's that's a really interesting observation. And I don't know that I've ever thought about it this way before. Have you ever met anyone who on their phone is afraid to push a button on their phone because they're afraid they're going to lose the information that's on their phone? No. And that is exactly the point I'm trying to make. That's fascinating. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that before, but that's true. That's exactly the point I'm trying to make. When you give a user, okay, again, I'm talking about average mm -hmm. user here, okay, not the geeks. When you give the user an, a tablet, a laptop, okay, another device, pick the device, okay, there is this little factor, fear factor of what if, mm -hmm. okay? They don't have that on the phone. The user is not afraid of the using their phone, click on click, click again, turn it on, turn it off. And I think that lack of fear, okay, one, yeah. in conjunction with the fact that they now, the reality is, again, the average user has spent more time on that phone than any other device, more than a laptop, more than any other device. And those two factors combined make that um for that phone to be the perfect device because now i can work without being afraid of the device and yeah that's for a non geek for a non or for a geek person okay talking about you and i mm -hmm. don't are not afraid of the technology okay we have always feel or i have always feel so much freedom inside of the device but i'm not afraid of the device but if you are afraid of the device, and now I give you, okay, you can work into your PC or you can work into this device called the phone that you are not afraid. Hey, give me the phone. You, I have to wonder, are people, are people missing a healthy fear of their phones? And here's what I mean. If you think about a laptop and you use your laptop at home or for your business, and everything you need is in there. You are terrified that it's going to crash. You're going to lose all the information in there. But yet we will take a device that costs easily double what most laptops cost, has more storage than most laptops, and put more really important information mm -hmm. about ourselves and our world in those and stick it in our back pocket and just go on our merry way. We have no fear of the repercussions of what our interactions with that little pocket device is. Nope. And the only reason why I can think of why that's the case is because the user experience is cute, for lack of a better term. It, it, is, it is a tailored user experience to any step in the process that you're doing because it's limited based on screen size and it's limited based on you know available information to provide. You can't put pages of information up on the screen because you just don't have that space. So everything has to be dumbed down mm -hmm. to the point where it's very simple, very clean, very efficient. And if it's not, users push back right away. They say, I can't figure out where this is which yep. we all know is just silly. It's just they're not trying most of the time. But those devices become, have become so integrated with us that we are almost blind to the impact they have on us uh, on a daily basis. And this, this is raising two, two interesting news events that have been happening as of late in my mind that I think tie into this. One is the increasing litigation here in the u.s of schools banning cell phones in the classroom the other the flip side is companies like huawei just releasing their tri-fold phone 
So when you and I saw the first video of this thing today, when this thing is open, it's a freaking tablet. It is bigger mm -hmm. than the Samsung Fold. It is a full size yep. tablet. So so I have to go to two questions then. I'm going to I'm going to pose both questions to you. The first question is, what do you think about cell phones in the classroom? Second question and this is probably the more complicated one, is if these phones are becoming our ubiquitous center of productivity, why aren't people clamoring more for the foldables, specifically the productivity foldables, not the, not the entertainment, not the social media ones, but the productivity style ones that actually open up into a near tablet. So I'm curious what you think about both of those questions. So there are two things to to that question, okay? One is, let's remember the goal of education, okay? And part of the problem, and I see this on the school that my kids go to, are the teachers good? The teachers are incredible. They are incredibly humans, but they are not tech people, okay? Mm -hmm. They learn and teach and know how to teach in a certain way. Okay, they don't understand or don't realize or don't want to recognize that they teach the kids learn in a different way. And you will see it with your grandchild because your kids are too older for, for you to see it. Okay. But my kids, okay, do the homework and they review the homework with the Amazon device. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's natural. And it's not that they are not thinking or learning the math or doing these things is they are already three steps ahead of where we were. Okay. I mean, it is just a, there was a meme years ago saying, ha, huh, and the teacher said that I was never going to have a calculator all the time in my pocket. Ha. Huh. Okay. And we have a calculator all the time in our pockets and a much more. And the other thing is we, humans are in denial about the speed of the evolution. Right? You will find a significant amount of parents who are completely against communicating with their kids via text message. No, they need to call me. Sorry, your kid is not going to call you. So you have two options. You can try to push where you want your kid to communicate with you. And by the way, you are going to fail as the generation before you fail with you, let me remind you when you were your first job X amount of years back and you were required to do things like, why? This makes no sense. Well, it's the same. Okay. Or you adapt to what are the needs to communicate with your child. Okay. Do I will prefer my kids call me or my kids come and talk to me? Yes. Are they going to be their main medium of communication? No, not today, not tomorrow, not ever. These kids communicate via text. You want to communicate with them? Do it via text. Part of the problem is that the school system wants to communicate that way, wants to communicate how you and I, three generations back, were teach. And it's not going to happen. Okay. The kids well, okay. have access to things that you and I didn't even dream of have access. One, do yeah. I believe, do they need limits? Without any doubt. Okay. okay. They need limits. Okay. But the limit is never an absolute. It's not, okay, now we need to eliminate the phones. No, no, no. What we need to do is to learn how you put limits into what these kids can do. iPhone. An Android has the time limits on the devices. The uh, Amazon tablet has the time limits on the devices. Most people don't know how to use that. They don't have a clue. Well, okay, hold on. So I, I think we're getting off in a bit of a tangent here because the specific question was around um, cell phones in the classroom. And I think cell phones in the classroom is a totally different conversation because... I have a dear friend who teaches seventh and eighth grade history and 
his school has just started implementing these these programs and he said the shift in attention that he gets from the students when they don't have devices in their hands while class is going on is palpable i mean there is a clear clear refocusing of their attention the devices are distractions there's no question about it and we can't say they're not because we look at adults sitting in a meeting who have no idea what the hell's going on because they're sitting fut futzing around with their phone <laughs> So right. we we know we know it happens in both cases. I think in the I, classroom. What is the difference in that case or for that child between the Chromebook that you are allowing him to see the things, the Chromebook or the iPad, depending on the school or the phone? Because the phone is not the school's. The Chromebook's a different conversation because the Chromebook's a dedicated device. The school has control over what they can and can't do with that that Chromebook. So they're not sitting there scrolling through TikTok. They're not sitting there, you know, flipping through Instagram off of the Chromebook. And you can much more easily walk over and close the Chromebook. When you have a situation where, where students and parents, parents are actually really bad about this. Parents will say, no, my kids should have their, their phone with them at all times. I need to be able to reach them at all times. I'm sorry. I'm Gen X. I'm lucky if my parents knew where I was from dawn to dusk. This is this is a mindset thing that we've developed that we need this digital umbilical cord to our kids. There has to be a certain understanding that if they're in the classroom, they are working. That is their job at that time right. period. And I think there is no there's nothing wrong with in the classroom. They're gone. You put them away. They are done. And if, if kids violate those rules, but that then places the onus on the teacher to be the policeman as well as the educator and you know i've i've talked to a lot of different teachers who have said you know the mindset is very different you know kids can actually be very combative about that you're taking away probably the most important thing that's in their world which is that little you know sl you know slab well, of black but the glass. parents the parents don't help i remember oh no i don't know a couple of years back i Pick my kid to school and the teacher say, can we talk? Oh, you know, we are having maybe an issue with your son. Go to Chase. And then the lady told me, well, I can't. He said that he did the homework and I cannot find it, blah, blah, blah. And the teacher was shocked that I took her side. And well, yeah, because that's me. a rare the thing problem. Anymore. Is most of the parents that, that I was aware of, most of the parents will doesn't matter if you now lose it. Is your no, no, no. You need to understand where the kid is, right, and when the kid mm -hmm. is not. Yeah, it's 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 interesting if we're if we're encouraging adults to view their phones as their primary device. We have to be cognizant of the fact that that mindset will then trickle down into their kids because that's how they're raising them. That's what the kids are observing all the time. Mm -hmm. And in situations where access and, and having those devices out is inappropriate or actually detrimental to what they're doing. As a populace, we have to be able to say, yeah, there is a time and a place for all of these things. And this is neither the time nor the place. Nor the place. Uh, and maybe I'm old school on some of that stuff, but yeah, there there are certain times where it's just not. There's no call for it. I mean, there's lots of times where there is, and it is up to individual parents to administer for their own children. I would never deny that at all. But in places like a classroom, I I have to agree, there has to be that option. I've I've always had this vision of a product if i could if i could design it build it and sell it i figured i could make you know millions and millions of dollars and what they are is they're little lock boxes that are attached to every student desk that are controlled by a central button at the teacher's desk and when the teacher pushes the button and all the little lock boxes open on the desks and the students put their phone in and the box closes and at the end of class the teacher can push the button again and the but the box opens and they can take their phones out that that solves the problem Sort of, maybe, who knows? But that's kind of where we have to get to with some of this is we are we are encouraging 
this portable, you know, pocket supercomputer generationally, we have to understand there have to be guidelines around it. It's it's no different than any other piece of technology or machinery. Now, the second question. If this is such a really powerful device, it's so convenient, it is so wonderful for doing so many things, why aren't foldables selling better? Why isn't why doesn't everybody just trading in their phones and getting foldables? What is it about that that's holding them back? So let me ask the question, and I don't know. I have no clue. How, what is the percentage on Android uh, on sales-wise foldable versus non-foldable? No foldable, sir. And I ask mostly because I I have an iPhone and foldable is not an option for me. Let's see. The worldwide foldable market is forecast to reach 25 million devices by the end of 2024, which is a 37% increase from 2023. Um, now, that said, I mean, that sounds sounds pretty good. I mean, that sounds like a decent number. Uh, but when we look at worldwide phone sales for the year, it's 285 million in the second quarter of 2024. So it's just a sliver of those devices out there. They're growing. They're certainly growing. And, and it could be, you know, cost is absolutely prohibitive. Cost is them. a factor. Okay. I mean, it's the same thing of the tablet. I have wondered why people don't use the tablet more. Okay. And why? Because most of the experience people have with tablets is not great. Why? Because you need to invest in the tablet, okay? And and you use tablets, but if you go and buy yeah. for yourself an Amazon Kindle Fire as your tablet experience, okay, you will not use mm -hmm. that thing. Why? Because that is thing is a Kindle that can do other things, not a tablet, okay? So that's a problem where cost the phones people understand okay well i need a phone okay and okay now mm -hmm. i get and even when you look the samsung events the iphone events or the apple events what are the features that they Announced, and I'm sorry, Apple, Samsung, Google, they are spending millions into trying to sell this device. It's mm. never power. It's never battery. The batteries are slightly improved. Okay. It's not capabilities. It's camera, TV, audio. Yeah. Because that's what the average people, the, av the average people may not be willing to buy the flagstone of the Samsung device because it's too expensive. Oh, but the mm -hmm. cool camera that that's worth it. Yeah. So they don't and buy I... the powerful phone for the foldability. They've bought it for the cool camera and then use the other features. It It's interesting thinking about it that way because you get into the whole discussion of, well, why don't they just buy the biggest phone then i mean the one i have is a 6.8 inch screen it's it's this ridiculously big screen um but it then goes back to the very beginning of our conversation then goes to it's cost. what fits in your pocket well there's cost but it's what fits in your pocket what fits in your hand what is comfortable you don't want the giant stuffed teddy bear from costco what you want is the little one that you can squeeze and hold. Well, that's Correct. what you're what you're getting with most of these devices is the little one that makes you feel comfortable. And now we want that little one to do all the things. And I think we're going to. But even even I was I'm part of a group and we were discussing the iPhone announcements and somebody was saying, oh, well, I really want the pro, but I don't. I will not get it. And we were asking why, curiosity, okay? And the reason is for this person, and again, it could be an anomaly. For this person, the money was not the object. 
the object was that the phone, the say point the six point eight, was too big for his pocket, and he was right. concerned that was not going to be that comfortable. And we were joking, you know, that after you go max, because the the largest version on the iPhone is the max. So when you go max, you don't go back. And and it's true, okay, people I know who has bought the iPhone Max mm -hmm. has a stain on there, okay? Because it's what you said. Hey, it's it's very comfortable to have the massive screen. And my main machine is a portable keyboard with an iPad mini and an iPhone Max. And I have those two devices mm -hmm. side by side all day. But there is there is a fine line in between the size and and the cost and what is that main feature people still buy phones as phones not as, as computers the, so, the line is changing but not conscious mm -hmm. they are not conscious oh i bought a new computer okay it's not oh i went and bought the new iphone because it's going to replace this task that i do I bought the new iPhone because the camera is awesome, because I'm going to be able to watch TV, because I'm going to be able to... They don't go into the computing capabilities, even when those are the capabilities that they are going to use the most. I, I think it's interesting because the, the breadcrumbs now are starting to connect for me here. This may partially explain why platforms like Samsung DeX are not more well received and that's because it's taking the uber comfortable phone device that you have right. and turning it into the thing that you are trying to get away from which is a computer yeah. granted and it gives you all that power and capability for you it's incredibly exciting as a geek because it gives mm -hmm. you the full power of the phone and the full power of the of the chromebook great mm -hmm. for the average user it turned my safe device where i'm very comfortable mm -hmm. into something that eh, i don't know so so here's an interesting uh, two more two more observations as of late um when i was reading an article that was talking about there is there's becoming a resurgence in single use devices um recorders cameras specifically we're starting to see those coming back gopros releasing mo some more and there was a lot of talk for a long time that those single purpose devices were going to really just dry up and disappear because the phone could do all the things. But I have to be inclined to think that there will always be a place for focused devices. And that's where I think some of these tablets start to fall into, like the Kindles, for example. I mean, you, you don't want to take a $2,000 tablet to the beach, but you don't mind taking a $200 one. Correct. You don't mind taking a, an $80 Kindle to, you know, on vacation with you for your kids, for them to be able to read books or, or watch things. So they're, while they can't do 95% of the really fancy things, the job that they can do, they do well, which goes back to what we were talking about earlier. What's the tool for the task at hand? Uh, so I find, I find that interesting. The second thing though, is I've been as part of a work project, I've been evaluating a field tablet for use for some field installers of, of um, equipment, and they need something very robust, very strong. It can, you know, you can beat the tar out of it and it still survive. And there's been a lot of things I've been trying to dig through. Is like, does it make sense to do a two-in-one laptop, to do a ruggedized laptop, to do something like an iPad or something like that in a heavy-duty case? Uh, one cost is prohibitive across the board for almost all of those. But I stumbled across the Samsung Galaxy Tab Alt or Tab Active 5. Their naming is horrific. They really need to fix that. But anyway, it's a tablet that's really only like seven and a half inches screen size. It's small enough that you can hold it in both hands and type with your thumbs across the entire width. It's not much larger than iPad mini. But here's what I thought was interesting about it. This unit, out of the box, brand new, latest mod model, had two things. A removable battery and a headphone jack. Today. 
and this is where I go back to well, on some of these need devices. To end the inventory of headphone things. <laughs> no. Oh, you know, <laughs> for their purposes, it has it has physical buttons on the front of it. It has three oh, wow. physical buttons. One of the buttons is actually the uh, fingerprint reader too. So when you look at this device, it's very much a throwback kind of field device, but it is eminently practical for the task that is being asked to do. I wouldn't try and do word processing on the thing, but standing out somewhere in the middle of a field using LTE as my connection, reviewing an installation diagram from Adobe, from a PDF file, this is a really good purpose for it. It's very robust. And that's where I, I think that we have to really be careful as we recommend things to people to not shy away from the, well, you really need a tool that does that job. Now, if that tool can do other things, that's wonderful. But if that's the job that you need to accomplish, if you need to be digitally signing documents all the time, well, then, yeah, I'm going to recommend something that includes a stylus. I'm going to recommend something that's going to give you the ability to read it easily. But I'm probably not going to recommend to you a high-end laptop for that job because there's it doesn't match the need. And as, as we think about our cross-platform tools and our cross-platform capabilities, and in previous episodes when we've talked about our truly blended environments where we'll have PCs and Android phones and Apple tablets all operating in the same environment. Well, now we go back to that least common denominator, which is how do you access the information and what's the software that's available across all three? If you mm -hmm. have functional tools that way that can allow you to use the hardware, yeah, you're going to be more productive, but that's what we're talking about is a lot of planning and honestly, a fair amount of experience necessary to be able to map that system and structure out. I mean, anybody who says they can just hand you a, you know, hand you a tablet or hand you a phone and you'll be able to do all your things is just trying to sell you that tablet or phone. Yeah. I, so I need to agree there. So one last thing as we um as we sort of wrap up for this, uh, I know Apple had their latest round of announcements of their their new phones and their new things. Um, did you have a chance to to look at it? Did you see anything of interest that you wanted to bring up? Um, well, it comes back to what are the features that they are? Moving is the phone powerful? Yes, but it, a lot of the features that they announced were the cameras, those kind of things. For most people, I don't know if they need that much power. You know, the iPhone for me has come back when when the iPhone, the initial iPhone came, the cycle of upgrade because innovation was every year. I think it was by the third iPhone. So the first three iPhones were year, year, year. And if it was an iPhone 3 or the or the next one, the 3GS, where that changed to every two years for me. Okay, mm -hmm. why? Because the features, yeah, they were improving, but it was not um, the needed too. And... My for me specifically, the iPhone is not my main device. Okay, my main device is the iPad, and I carry the iPad anywhere I go, and the iPad is with me 24/7. If I could synchronize things like my sensors and my watch to the iPad instead of the phone, I may not even carry the phone that much i don't get phone calls okay i i it's so rare that i get a phone call most of my things are via teams or via telegram or via whatsapp and i can do that on the tablet i have and i could even attend a phone call if i want on my ipad so 
that is an issue will depend where you are. The, the big promise for the iPhone 16 is the inclusion of the Apple intelligence, but it is still too new to know really what's going to bring and to know, in my opinion, if it's really a must to have or a cool to have. Right now, my verdict, until proven otherwise, is a cool to have as of today. I'm inclined to agree with you there right now, current state. I mean, granted, there are a bunch of times where I will use AI-based stuff, uh, but most of the time I'm using AI on the PC for specific tasks. I have not really had a, a reason to use it. I have Gemini loaded. Uh, Samsung's making a hardcore press or a full core press with it. Uh, I have not really worked with it on the phone because it, it really, the things I'm doing have not warranted the capabilities of what it can do mm. on that device. Now, I have seen some of it in the background. So, for example, like photo editing, the AI capabilities within photo editing have gotten much better. And if it's improved photo editing. That, I think, is a very good use of it. But this whole press a button, have an AI assistant, uh, okay, fine. Um, I think time will tell with that. But your your comment about your being primary the iPad, not an iPhone, raises an interesting question for me. And I'm going to throw this one at you. If Apple were at their next event to announce the foldable iPhone, would that change your thinking? Yes. If they give me an iPhone that I can expand to the size of a tablet, I will buy that device without any question. But I'm, but I'm going to say that my the device that I didn't expect Apple to bring that was a Vision Pro. I did not expect a Vision Pro. Okay, is probably out of my Apple devices my favorite. It is an antisocial device. Okay. No question about it. Okay. Yeah. I don't care that I can see you. I can put, I can have a conversation with you if I have my goggles. Okay. That said from working, it is the best computer I have. If I don't need to interact with humans, it is because I have basically an unlimited canvas. So I can mm -hmm. have a screens and move around that power. It doesn't work for social, but for work it's incredible. Even with their limitations that still the platform have, that is my favorite device. Even if I, if, if I can write the tendency and I could be right or wrong at this point, I don't know. I think a foldable device, like what you are describing, may replace for me the iPads and then will be that device and a Vision Pro. That's it. Yeah, I I really, I know it's kind of a tangent for us, but the, the whole VR goggle, VR helmet, whatever the heck, you know, because I've got the, the Quest 3 um, and Meta just killed off the plans to do their um, Quest Pro 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to really focus on lower end devices, which makes sense to establish a much larger foothold. But even just doing doing the things that I do with mine, you know, multiple discrete, multiple screens, you know, mirroring PCs and all, I can see that functionality. And to me, I think there's a logical extension of having a phone that acts not only as the power source, but the computing center for those types of that type of a headset. And if it's that, if all the power and the, and the processing is in that heavy duty little supercomputer you have, then that headset can become so much smaller. Yeah. It's just displays. Then that's to me, that's starting to get much but more see, fascinating. Then. I have the two devices. I have the vision pro that I love. And I have one called the B Tour glasses that basically right. connect my iPhone and give me a very big screen. 
The problem is jet on those devices. What I can do is expand the size of my screen. So don't take me wrong. Yes. It is very nice. I take my keyboard. I take that. My kids do sports. So I take that, put my glasses and I can work instead of working on my phone on that massive screen. Great. If you ask me that device versus my Vision Pro, I grab my Vision Pro. If I can choose, my Vision Pros are the device. Because what it gives me is the ability of the interaction of the screens. I mean, the fact that I can start working with a document or working with something and then move it around and bring and put two things. And that power, I have the, the current versions of those classes don't do. Uh, not even if you connect them to the Mac. And that that is that Apple called the spatial computing. It may be too early in the game, but the mm -hmm. power, it's completely antisocial, but the power, it is incredible. I mean, completely antisocial. Okay. I even I have come to the point that I have stopped wearing it in the living room if there is family in the living room, because I get there and I get so in mm -hmm. the space that you ignore that the people are there in the living room. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. I can totally see that. I use it as as a heavy entertainment device. And, you know, you can't beat full size movie theater display and sound wrapped right around your head. I mean, you can't really argue with that. Working and having four or five virtual screens that you can move around and, and pop. That's also really, really compelling. Um, but that's just a small use case of where I think this this is going. This could potentially go. Um, I think we could we will get there. Uh, I want to say the next. I'm not going to say next five years. I'm going to say next ten. Uh, five, I think, is still a little short cycle for some of these because there's some physical limitations that have to be beat. Uh, but once you start to get to that, we still we still go back to the core thing. We have the most powerful computers around in our back pocket. Mm -hmm. And the more we can take advantage of those, whether it's specialized purpose or generalized purpose, the more we get out of it and the more productive we are. So, yeah. all right. Take us out, sir. Well, thank you. Follow us where you like to listen to podcasts, like us or subscribe to us and leave us a review. We also... You can interact with us on Personal Productivity Club. There is a channel there for cross-platform. In the meantime, thank you. And we are good to be out on our good weeks. And see you next time on your favorite device. Thank you.